Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our Talks with Walt as we are calling our working now, can we say it, walking through as well as talking through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We now turn to Song of Myself, passage number 46. Now, let's go ahead and get it out of the way right now. I will dedicate this lecture to all of the students who I've ever worked with in 303 who, or who I ever will work with in room 303. I'm sometimes asked by teachers to talk about teaching. What do you, what do you mean when you say teaching and student learning? And without, without question, I always will come to passage 46 of Song of Myself. This is without question the most important passage to room 303. Most of my students will argue that probably the most important passage in all of Leaves of Grass, although we'll obviously have to debate it once you actually have been exposed to the passage itself. Now, this is, as we've said, the crescendo moment. These last set of lines as we're moving towards passage 52 of Song of Myself. And put it in your notes, this is the integralist pedagogy. What do we mean by pedagogy? Well, the way a teacher will teach a student. Here, in this passage, we're going to have a teacher speaking directly to the student. Now, I've already given a lecture a number of years ago over this passage, and it's there, posted at YouTube, but it's there in the descriptor description box of this lecture. I do recommend that either now you go and witness that one, or you play around with it after the fact. I will repeat a good amount of what I've said there, but I will not repeat some of the other things that I say there. Now, just to remind, we have said that the key line for Song of Myself, interestingly, doesn't come from 46 for us, but rather from 4, where he says, both in and out of the game, and watching and wondering at it, I witness and wait. We will add, of course, I teach as well now to the project. Now, we have said, Whitman started as a teacher, and remained a teacher all his life, and that's what makes this passage for us as students, and of course as teachers, so vital, so precious, can we use that term. Now the key assumptions are, at LearnStrong.net, you've been with us for the 24 poems of inscriptions, especially that poem, Idolins. Now when I did Idolins with you, I said, we're doing the first of the long poems of, Song of Leaves of Grass to get ready for what's coming we're now here. This is what's coming. Because we talk a lot about Plato's pedagogy, from, of course, Plato's Republic, especially Book 7, where he postulates a group of people stuck in a dark cave, chained up so they can't move, looking at shadows on a wall created by the fire behind them. And that's their reality until somebody from the outside, can we call him a teacher, comes in and says to one of them, Note, it is one of the youngest. i got to show you something. And he un unchains the child, the young person. Turns him around, points him to the fire and says, what you're looking at on the wall, it ain't real, it's shadows. Let me show you what is real. And he drags him, the kid, kicking and screaming out of the cave into the light of the sun. Now, we call this an allegory. And, of course, it's an allegory of what? Well, it's Plato's pedagogy. That is to say, you want to learn anything, it's usually going to involve some fear and some pain. That's the way it works. But by the time you exit that cave, you understand there's two kinds of sight. There is outside looking at shadows on a wall, but there's this thing we call perspicacity, insight. It will be here that Whitman, I think, will be most inspired as he will be playing that game. Um, starting from Pominock, our 19 sections I'm hoping that you'll have messed with, and of course, Song of Myself, from that intro lecture all the way through to passage 45. Remember in passage 6, a child comes to the speaker of the poem and says, what is this, the grass? And what is it that the teacher says? I don't know. How can I know any better than you? Perhaps it's... Hmm. And then he begins to talk about the grass. We're going to have reverberations, echoes, can we say it that way? I have said before, you can't really read the great American poet and British poet T.S. Eliot without having a real understanding of Leaves of Grass. What is it that T.S. Eliot says in those opening lines of Burt Norton, the first of the four quartets? We've given full lectures on this at LearnStrong.net. My words echo thus in your mind, but to what purpose disturbing the dust on a bowl of rose leaves I do not know. Other echoes inhabit the garden, shall we follow? Quick, said the bird, find them, find them. 
those echoes, and we're going to hear a lot of those here in this passage. Now, I have lots of students who have studied passage 46 with me. What they often haven't done is to have read everything from the very first word of the deathbed edition of Leaves of Grass Come, said my soul, all the way to this moment. If you have done that reading with me, first of all, congratulations, you're nearing the end now of Song of Myself. If you've done that reading with me, the amount of echoes that you will hear will blow your mind. Finally, let's remind ourselves of one of those famous mantras that we learned from Ken Wilber and other philosophers. The map is not the territory. You can look at a map all day long, but you've got to go out into the territory if you really want to know the territory, and we're going to play that game here. The words of the teacher to the student. Now, a last comment. We, in the deathbed edition, are looking at numbered sections. From the 1855 Song of Myself, there were none of these numbers, so that you went from one section to the next section. Now, up to this point, we haven't had any real serious observations about the numbering of these sections. Here we will. Because I think, can we say this without fear of blasphemy? I think Whitman got it wrong. I think there's four lines that he should have added to 46 that he adds to the beginning of 47. So when we read 46, we're actually going to continue into 47 for the first three or four lines of 47 because they have to go together, I believe. And most readers of this poem will go, you know what, I think you're right on that count. I think I can make that argument. Let's just enjoy the, the lines, shall we? I know I have the best of time and space and was never measured and never will be measured. I tramp a perpetual journey. Come, listen, all. My signs are a rainproof coat, good shoes, and a staff cut from the woods. No friend of mine takes his ease in my chair. I have no chair, no church, no philosophy. I lead no man to a dinner table, library exchange, but each man and each woman of you I lead upon a knoll, my left hand hooking around the waist, my right hand pointing to landscapes of continents and the public road. Not I. Not anyone else can travel that road for you. You must travel it for yourself. It's not far. It's within reach. Perhaps you've been on it since you were born and did not know. Perhaps it's everywhere, on water and on land. Shoulder your duds, dear son, and I will mine, and let us hasten forth. Wonderful cities and free nations we shall fetch as we go. If you tire, give me both burdens, and rest the chuff of your hand on my hip, and in due time you shall repay the same service to me. For after we start, we never lie by again. This day before dawn, I ascended a hill and looked at the crowded heaven, and I said to my spirit, when we become the unfolders of those orbs and the pleasure and knowledge of everything in them, shall we be filled and satisfied then? And my spirit said, No, we but level that lift to pass and continue beyond. You are also asking me questions, and, and I hear you. I answer that I cannot answer. You must find out for yourself. Sit a while, dear son. Here are biscuits to eat. Here's milk to drink. But as soon as you sleep and renew yourself in sweet clothes, I kiss you with a goodbye kiss and open the gate for your egress hence. Long enough have you dreamed contemptible dreams. Now I wash the gum from your eyes. You must have it yourself to the dazzle of the light in every moment of your life. Long have you timidly waited holding a plank by the shore. Now I will you to be a bold swimmer, to jump off in the midst of the sea, rise again, nod to me, shout, and laughingly dash with your hair. I am the teacher of athletes. He that by me spreads a wider breast than my own proves the width of my own. He most honors my style who learns under it to destroy the teacher. Now, the argument that we're going to make is that those last lines are, of course, an important part of our reading of passage 46. Notice how we will begin. All five of our big five are here in this poem. The big five are from 303. One, epistemology. What can I know? Two, ontology. Who am I, anyway? Three, psychology. The study of the individual mind. Four, sociology the study of group minds, and finally five, theodicy, 
the question, why do bad things have to happen in this world? Why is there pain? Why is there suffering? Now, Whitman is going to, as a teacher, speak directly to you, the student, and say, I know some things. Here's what I know. I know I have the best of time and space. Whoa. So let's just put it in our notes right away. For Whitman, the teacher, he says, I'm not interested in going back and living in some prior time. I respect that. I love the fact that we have texts like the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid. Oh yeah, the Odyssey. It's a poem about a guy named Odysseus that takes a long journey. Oh yeah. He's definitely playing with all this old stuff. That's why we say in 303, the classics are so important. That's why we read them, but we don't live in the past. As we have said, though, the new is the new. The N-E-W is the K-N-E-W. Notice, it's the best of time and space. Of course, time and space, we've heard those reminiscences already, haven't we, right? All the echoes we're going to hear. He says, and I was never measured and never will be measured. Notice we're going to lift, uh, we're going to level the lift here in a little bit. Whitman grew up as a carpenter and his daddy was a carpenter. So he knew all about building stuff. And so he said, you can't measure me. In other words, in the same way you can't measure a cosmos, you can't measure me. That's who I am. That's his own statement of who he is. Notice he continues with a very American verb. I would say, when I'm asked sometimes when I travel and teach internationally, can you give me a classic example of American literature? And I'll say, sure, passage 46 of Song of Myself. Tramp? Tramp? Are you serious with me? What does that word even mean? Well, technically it means to walk. But of course, tramping has the idea as well in the American tradition of going out on the journey. We're going to hear more of this when we meet Song of the Open Road. I tramp, but notice it's not a journey. Did you see it? It's a perpetual journey. Lifelong learning. Your schooling is not your education. Your schooling is only a small part of your education. Your life is your education. You are on a perpetual journey. And then he says it, although not in the 1855 edition, come listen all. Now, of course, the use of that word all takes us back to starting from Pominock, passage number seven. Omnis, omnis, that notion of all, the, the complete. In other words, this is going to be the teacher speaking to all students, whoever you are. Come listen, all. Now he'll tell us what he wants us to hear. First of all, he tells us about his signs. Notice there's three of them. Do you see it? My signs are what? What do you really need? A rainproof coat. He's going to spend a lot of time outside. Good shoes, because he's going to walk a long time. And a staff cut from the woods, because he's going to get tired. He's got to have something to lean on. Now, of course, all three of these can be read literally. And, of course, metaphorically or figuratively. And that's what makes this passage so provocative. It can work on both counts. Notice he says, no friend of mine. And he will kind of reach out to the reader and say, hey, 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 you're my friend. You're my student. You're my friend. No friend of mine takes his ease in my chair. No, no, no. Learning isn't easy. No, no, no. Learning is hard work. Again, borrowing from the ideas of Plato's Republic 7, it's going to involve some fear and some pain. Remember our story of my son Mikey learning how to ride his bike without his training wheels. He was awesome on those training wheels. And when he came to me and said, I'm ready to learn without training wheels, I said, let's do it. The moment he got on that bike without training wheels, he froze up. Why? Because my Mikey was a scared. Why? I asked him, son, what's the problem? I'm afraid I'm going to fall down. It's going to hurt. Oh, son, you have no idea. You're about to crash here in a few seconds. It's going to hurt something awful. Let's go. See, we have this tendency to forget. Learning isn't about ease. He says, no, no, no. I don't put you in no chair. I'm going to make you go on a walk. And it's going to be a long walk. And guess what? You're going to get tired. And guess what? You're going to fall. And guess what? It's going to hurt. And of course, my Mikey did fall. And then, oh boy, did it hurt. And of course, who is he mad at? Not himself for forgetting how to use his brakes. Not mad at the city engineer for putting the curb in the wrong spot. Right. He's mad at me for having the gall to take his training wheels off. Even though, of course, he had asked for it. Funny thing about kiddos, they want the fear and the pain even though they know it's coming and they're afraid of it. That's called learning. In other words, he says, no ease in my chair. And then he says it. And if, we, if you've been reading every line of Leaves of Grass up to this point, you know that what he says right here is absolutely true. I have no chair, no church, 
No philosophy. Remember at the beginning of Song of Myself, he said creeds and schools and abeyance. It's not that he is going to disregard church and philosophy. It's that he's going to say, you got to figure out some stuff for yourself. You can't just be told all your life what you're going to believe. So I'm not going to give you my chair. I'm not going to give you my theology. I'm not going to give you my philosophy. He says, here's what I will do. Each, notice the repetition of the word each, each man, I, oh, I'm sorry, I missed the line. I lead no man to a dinner table. No, 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 no. Now we're going to get the biscuits and milk in a bit. No, no, no. This isn't about sitting around a table and talking while we're eating. No, 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 no. I lead no man to a dinner table library. You'll remember from the inscriptions, he was asking to be his poems to be included, this book of poems to be included in the libraries. Library, of course, here will have to do with the intellectuals, with schools. Uh, no exchange. I'm not taking you. In other words, no, 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 no. We're not going to the to Socrates' Agora. We're not going to the mall. No, I'm not interested in you making a lot of money. Interesting. Somebody asked me recently, how come some of your students write such high ECT scores? It doesn't matter to me. We got enough smart, mean people in this world. Not interested in money. Not interested in exchange. That's not where I'm taking you. Well, where is it? that he's going to take you. Notice the repetition of each. Each man, each woman. See the inclusivity of the language, right? Each man, each woman of you, I lead upon a knoll. Now, knoll, if you know anything about JFK, you know about the grassy knoll. Knoll just means hill. In other words, where we live, this is like taking you up on Rattlesnake Ridge. What can you do on Rattlesnake Ridge? Oh, baby, do you have a vista from there? You can see a long, long ways. Look at how he says it. I, I lead you upon a knoll. By the way, did you notice it? Put it in your notes. Teachers. Are leaders. They lead. Right? They lead. But how they lead is significant here, side by side. Why? Because both are going to get tired. In other words, the teacher is the student and the student is the teacher. But first, the teacher's got to show you something. You got to see something. That's the whole point of school. I lead you to Ponte Noel. My left hand, notice the physicality of this. And if you've been reading with us through Saw to myself especially, you notice all the physicality of this language. My left hand hooking you around the waist. We know all about waists. We've heard it over and over again in our reading of all these poems. My right hand pointing to landscapes of continents. And in the 55 edition, he called it the plain public road. Here it's just the public road. Let's say three things really quickly about this word picture. Well, what is it that the teacher does? Well, the teacher takes the student up onto a, a, no, a, 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 a mountain, a hill, a way to see. It's all about vision. It's all about vision. What's he do next? He or she puts one arm around, the left arm, around to encourage, and the other points. Hey, I'm just telling you where we're about to head. Just so you know, the map is not the territory, but you need a map. Oh, you need a map. You gotta have a map. You gotta have a plan. You gotta have some idea of where it is you're headed. Or you're just out in the middle of the badlands without any idea at all. Of course, the only thing about a map is it only works if you know where you're at. You notice that about maps? They don't do anything for you if you don't know where you are on the map. In other words, you gotta have a knoll. You gotta have a starting point. Number three, notice the teacher will point to landscapes of continents and the public road. There it is. That's where we got to go. Right there. Notice it's a public road. Later it will be an open road in a famous poem, Song of the Open Road. A foot and lighthearted I take to the open road. He will say they're healthy, free. The world before me. The long brown path before me leading wherever I choose. When we hit those lines later in our study of Leaves of Grass, you're going to come back to this passage here in 46. Then there's a break. Do you see it in your poem? Then there's a break. Intentionally so. Not I, the poet teacher now will say, not I, not anyone else can travel that road for you. Right? Your parents can't do it. Teachers can't do it. Older brothers, sisters can't do it. Friends can't do it. You got to do it yourself. This is personal responsibility. You got to take it on. Doesn't matter what anybody else says. Doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. The teacher cannot go there for the student. 
can I say this out loud? This is really, really hard on teachers and adults in general. Parents, really hard. Why? Because they want to take the pain for their children. They want to do it for their children so their children don't have to experience the pain. Can't do it, though. Can't do it. Only way that you can ever raise a child is to put the child out there on the road where there's going to be some serious challenges. Not I, not anyone else can travel this road for you. You must travel it for yourself. That's the key. That's why we read Homer's Odyssey. Odysseus has to go on the journey himself. And is it going to cause him a lot of pain? Oh, you bet. Oh, you bet. Is it going to be hard even when he gets on? Oh, you bet. And in the end, it won't be so much even about the destination, will it? That's why we read that really important poem. It's all about that journey. Now, it's all about traveling, right? And to some degree, I mean, think about it. You've made it to this point in your study with us of leaves of grass. You've been traveling the whole time. In fact, he'll say it this way. Because the instincts are, notice the it is not far, it's within reach. Now, why does he have to say that? Because most students are going to look at that and go, oh, yeah, no, I don't, think this is the, I don't think this is the right time for me. I think I'm going to try this road a little bit later. And notice he'll say, no, 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 no. Teacher is encourager. You see this? No, 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 no. It's not far. It's within reach. And then brilliantly. Perhaps the fallible is positioned epistemologically. I think I'm right, but I could be wrong. Perhaps you've been on it since you were born and did not know. Oh, what an amazing insight. You've been on the road the whole time. You just didn't know it. You didn't realize it. By the way, did you see the word no? And did you see the first word of the poem? I know. In other words, the teacher understands something that the student doesn't understand. Y-E-T. That's the whole point of the job of the teacher, is to help the students start to figure some stuff out like, oh, no, 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 like Plato says in Republic. This is why Republic is such a precious text to us, because it reminds us, no, 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 your education started before two people hooked up and exchanged fluids and produced you, because they had a language they talked to you. They had views they shared with you.